Well, we've got an extraordinary God uh, that He's ready for. Every, he's ready for everything. Uh, Matt was praying with me this morning, and he said, "We know that uh, uh, God. We know that you know you're not surprised by anything. You're on the throne, and we know that you uh, have all things planned uh, in your in your. It's in your hands." And uh, we have a God who never sleeps, He never slumbers, uh, He knows exactly what's going on, and He's certainly not shaken by what is going on. I need to read the passage to you, so let's look at uh, chapter 8 and verse number 18. Let's just listen to the Word of God as I read it to you aloud. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know what we should, what, uh, what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. For he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren." Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. If I was to, if I was to have searched the entire Bible, I don't know of a better passage to talk about today than that one. And so we read the passage. I want to notice, I want you to notice something that the entire passage, chapter 18, actually through the end of the chapter, uh, is actually bouncing off of verse 17 when it said that, if, that we are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. And I want you to underline a few words in the passage here in just a moment, but remember this, suffering and glory. Suffering and glory are the twin themes from verse 18 all the way down through the end of the chapter. It's all about the suffering that we go through, the weakness that we endure, and it's about the glory of God that He promises that He's going to grant to each and every one of us. Look at these words that are in the passage. Verse 18, sufferings. Verse 20, futility. Verse 21, corruption. Verse 22, birth pangs. Verse, verse 26, weakness. Sounds like a whole lot of suffering going on in the passage. And I don't have to provide anybody with illustrations of suffering today because, I mean, the news has been filling us in on what's going on all over the world. And I, I feel so, so, um, so much empathy and pain for the people of northern Italy right now. It just seems like uh, that they, they can't get a grip on it at all. There's not enough, uh, not enough nurses, not enough doctors, not enough beds, not enough of the breathing units, and just many, many people are suffering in that part of the world as they are in other places. And so even before, however, the present event, uh, what we're dealing with with COVID-19, um, there was hunger in the world and sickness and disease. There was war and hate and violence and murder. There was rape, assault, racism, abuse, and the causes of pain and suffering in the world seem to be limitless, and they've been going on, it seems, time immemorial. Something has been wrong with our world. Something is wrong with our world. And what is wrong with our world is, is that in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation to sin. They believed Satan's lie for a moment, and they believed that there was advantage in disobeying their loving God and becoming gods of their own for a moment. Sin happened, and the world has been under the bondage of corruption ever since that. When we talk about this bondage of corruption, what it means is, is that death and decay began when Adam sinned. 
And so somebody's going to say, Pastor, I thought this was going to be an encouraging sermon. You know, you started this series full of hope. You talked about liberation, that we weren't condemned for our sin. You talked about emancipation, that we are not obligated to our old sinful nature, that we can, we can have victory over the sin that uh, attacks us in our life and the, and the temptation. Last week, you talked all about the privileges of sons of God and how that without reservation or fear, we can come to God at any time. We can have an appointment with Him for any reason at any time and stay as long as we want to. Pastor, that was all so encouraging, but now then you're talking about all of these things having to do with suffering. Well, hold on. Uh, We're just warming up. It gets better and better as we go. Uh, Verse 18 says, the present suffering is painful, but it says also that there is no comparison between the present suffering and the future blessing of glory. If I could give some sort of an illustration, it would be like comparing a BB to a basketball. Uh, I mean, there's no comparison to the weight of our suffering compared to the glory that God is working in us and for us and so on. So we got to see that there's a lot of groaning going on in the passage. It mentions it a lot. Sin has caused much graver problems. You know, people today kind of look like, look at sin. And when we disobey God and we do things that we know are patently wrong, we, we do things. Sometimes we talk about it as a misstep, took a wrong turn, you know, uh-oh, I, I, you know, it was a white lie, you know, those kind of things. Sin is a far graver issue for God and for humanity and truthfully for creation itself than we even can imagine. The groans that are listed in this passage of Scripture are being heard in heaven. I want to focus on the groans. What is it, who is it that's groaning, and what is it that heaven is hearing from earth? Just a few things. One, God's creation groans because of the curse of sin. That's verses 18 to 22. His creation is groaning. We don't always think of it, but the whole of creation, the whole of creation was dreadfully changed when sin entered the world. Sin brought a curse on creation. We talk of, you know, sort of we think, oh, yeah, there, was, there weren't thorns on the rose bushes, and then there were thorns. And then we think about, well, yeah, and the animals became aggressive, but I can't quite put my finger on anything else. It goes much farther than that, and this passage delineates what it is. One, creation is unfulfilled. Creation itself, the plan of God for creation, for this earth and this world to function to full capacity, is unfulfilled. Note the verse says in verse 20 that the earth, the creation, was subjected to futility. It's futile. Uh, the, the, the earth's abilities have been cut short. They've been stymied, dwarfed. The earth is not living up to its full potential. There are vast areas of the planet today, if we just stop and think about it, that don't produce anything. They don't produce anything to help its inhabitants, not the animals, not humans, not the botanical world. There's nothing that it's doing. Because why? Because vast areas of the earth are too cold. Vast areas of the earth are too hot. They're desert. There's just nothing that's able to live and to grow at these extreme places on the earth. So the earth is unfulfilled. Creation is unfulfilled. It's unproductive. It's not doing what it was designed to do completely. Creation is also under bondage. That's verse number 21. It says in 21, the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption, death and decay. Man's sin introduced death and decay on the earth. In the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. That's what the Lord told Adam, and Adam was supposed to communicate that clearly to Eve. Somehow the communication broke down, and Eve talked to Adam together, and they ate it. And so the promise was, and the warning was, the day that you eat of it, you will die. And so it literally says, dying, you will die. Things will begin to die. You will begin to die. And that's exactly what happened. Adam, at that point, began to age, and it was never going to happen before that point. And then, of course, ultimately, everything began to degenerate and die. Genesis 3 says one aspect of the curse would be that earth would be unwilling to yield its fruit. Man's going to have to work much harder than was originally planned. Man was intended to be an administrator, a co-regent, a manager of God's production system. But when sin came, he had to work by the sweat of his brow. He had to work much harder. The ground didn't want to yield its uh, productiveness. God's productive machine was, was malfunctioning. Man had to coax and compel the hardened ground to release its bounty. Creation, something else. Creation is waiting on something. It's waiting on revelation. 
Verse number 19, look at it in your scriptures. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. The revealing of the sons of God. You say, what's that talking about? Well, he said every aspect of what God, God said every aspect of what he made was good and it was very good. But then sin came and, he, and the creation that he made was cursed as was his environment. God in his grace had a plan for the redemption of man. Now, I've got news for you. God's plan for the redemption of man is for the redemption of the creation as well. When will this planet be redeemed? When will it be restored and become productive again? Well, it's going to be restored. It's going to be retooled. And when's it going to happen? When the sons of God are finally revealed. He says, well, don't we know who they are? We know who professes that they are the sons of God. But only time will tell when the Son of God Himself comes in great glory and power. The sons of God are going to be revealed. There's going to be a rapture. There's going to be a revealing. There's going to be a time when the graves open. There's going to be a time when we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. There's going to be a time when those tribulation saints who have suffered so much, they're going to be brought together and they're going to shine like the stars in the firmament forever, the Scripture says. Why? Because the sons of God are going to be revealed and guess who's going to be full of glee or what's going to be full of glee when we get revealed? The earth. The creation, I pictured in my mind, the thorns go away, and the animals get friendly, and lions lay down with the children, and the snakes don't bite anymore. Not that I want to cuddle up to a snake under any circumstance, but in any event, uh, it's all going to happen at His coming. Folks, we are going to be sown in weakness, but we're going to be raised in power, the Bible says. So creation is groaning. Here's how us is groaning. It's important. Creation is groaning like a woman in labor. That's what verse number 22 says. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And there's a lot of talk today about saving the planet, going green, eliminating carbon emissions, saving our home, planet Earth. But you know, we're living on a doomed planet. We are, yes, we are stewards of our environment. We should do nothing to make our living, our living, uh, living uh, uh, circumstances worse by the way we behave and by being irresponsible. However, we're not the saviors of the planet. We're not going to save the planet. We're not going to redeem the planet, retool the planet, restore the planet. God made it in the first place, and He's going to remake it one day, and He's going to make it right. The passage here gives, a, it gives personification to the planet. It makes the planet as if it was a person. It makes, it, makes us think the planet has feelings. It says the, the earth is groaning like a woman whose labor pains have begun. Uh, the planet, like an expectant mother, is waiting on the revelation of the new life to come. So a mother is going into her birth pains. And what's she waiting for? She's in pain, but she's waiting on the revelation, the unveiling of that little girl or that little boy that comes into the world. And so that's what she's waiting on. Well, our planet is groaning uh, like a mother that is waiting on a child to be born, to reveal the sons of God. And so the pains have come. It began to whine in the Garden of Eden, but it has been groaning tremendously ever since the flood. The creation itself is groaning. I'm not creating this myself. I'm reading you what the Scripture says in this passage of Scripture. Black ink on white paper, as I always like to say. The Bible says the creation is groaning, and uh, it has been groaning. I believe since the flood, it's been groaning tremendously. Just take, for instance, um, the, the, we, we look for the blessing of rain. But you know, rain is a blessing and a curse. If it rains too much, then you know what happens. In our state, we see it quite often. Too much rain, and it floods. Not enough rain, and things go bad. Well, the truth is, rain wasn't even part of the original plan. The Bible says the earth was like a garden and all under the subsoil there, were, there was water reservoirs and the water came up, formed mist, and it, all of the earth was watered without a drop of rain. It wasn't His plan. So when rain came, uh, things were changed. It says that water from beneath, that's Genesis 2, 5, and 6, watered the earth. When the flood happened, the Bible says the fountains of the deep broke up and rearranged the face of the earth. You know what? Today, the slipping of the tectonic plates causing earthquakes, the volcanoes, the tidal waves, and all these things are evidences of a groaning planet. 
The planet is groaning. All of these things that continue to happen. They've been happening ever since the Garden of Eden and even magnified at the flood. Because all of that water displacement under the surface of the earth created all kinds of pressure. It released volcanoes. It released pressure points. And every time the earth moves and the tectonic plates slip, it ought to remind us the earth's groaning. The earth's groaning, waiting for redemption. That's why I said to the beginning, the earth's not living up to its full potential yet. It's not as productive as it could be. But brethren, one day it will be. Because the sons of God are going to be revealed. And God is going to, according to Revelation 21, He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And it's going to be right once again. So creation is waiting for deliverance. Uh, All of that to say that the earth is waiting for the King to come. And to make everything right again. Something else, God's children groan. So creation groans and God's children groan. And I think a great groan goes up as I say that uh, 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 among all of our households today. You know, we're groaning too. In verse number 23, let me read it. It says, not only that, but we also who have the first, spirit, first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Oh, it's huge. Why do we groan? Why are believers groaning, even the children of God? Well, we groan because of the foretaste of deliverance. The foretaste of deliverance. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, listen to Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Well, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. And in moments like this, boy, it's, it's wonderful to have an anchor for my soul. It's wonderful to know that the Lord can be trusted. And you out there listening, I mean, whether you're a church member or not a church member, I just want to say to you, always remember to just keep going back. Like we sang a few minutes ago, you can go to the Father again and again and again and again. You can taste and see that the Lord is good. But I do want you to know it's just a taste. It's a foretaste. One day we're going to get the full blessing. Listen to Psalm 119, 103. I hope you're writing these verses down. Psalm 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my soul. God speaks sweet, sweet words of deliverance and sweet words of encouragement to us through His, through his Word. Here's another one, 1 Peter 2, 2. It says, now like newborn babes, we should desire the milk of the Word that you may grow thereby if Indeed, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And so, folks, we have by faith tasted God's grace, and we've tasted of His kindness, and we've tasted of His forgiveness. We've tasted of the love of God. We indeed enjoy the first fruits of the Spirit. But I don't know about you, but I'm waiting on a full harvest. I'm waiting on the full harvest of what God has promised for us. And so I praise the Lord for that. And so we know that there's much, much more to come. You know, on planet Earth, among the brethren, we have tasted of the sweet fellowship that must exist in heaven. We have tasted of those bonds of kinship. Because even on the platform here, just this few little people that are here, I have zero in common except the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, except Marty. He and I both like grits. But other than that, I have just very few things in common. But the common kinship is we are children of the Almighty. We have been born into His family. And so we have sweet fellowship and kinship. And then we have this, we have this sweet taste of worship. But it's only, Marty, I know you and Michael, this is, I mean, you live for this, and this is, you've trained for it, and done it, and lived for it, and you lead us wonderfully in worship, and boy, we are so blessed to have these men. But you know, you're just giving us a foretaste of what worship's going to be like in heaven. I mean, I don't care how good it gets in church, and sometimes I feel like I'm going to get raptured on the front row. But I'm telling you, I'm just telling you, it's just a foretaste. It's a foretaste. You know, we enjoy the foretaste of the divine nature. The Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 1, that he has given us his divine nature so that we could be partakers of the good world. Not, not be entangled in the corruption, that is death and decay. But we've got, but we've got a for, the Holy Spirit living in us is a foretaste of the divine nature. But it's only a taste. It's just a taste. We're waiting. And so, folks, don't get discouraged. I mean... God is good. We can enjoy Him and enjoy His sweet assurance even in times of trouble. Even when they're talking about COVID-19, even when they tell you stay home. I know the, the mayor of the town has just admonished us to take 14 days and just stay put. 
you not a law but a great encouragement boy uh, I know that it's hard I know your children are getting you know antsy and I know they're climbing the walls and uh, <laughs> we had little Zeke come for a visit the other day run around by himself just to get some wiggles out in the in the gym and I can understand what's going on I'm praying for you I'm praying for you moms praying for you dads you're concerned for your children for their education I just want to say to you mom and dad sit down and read with those children Get hooked up with whatever resources are available through your school systems and, and, and help them learn. I can't help but believe that Malachi chapter 4 comes into play here. Malachi chapter 4 says that I'm going to send a curse on the earth unless the fathers and the mothers turn their hearts toward their children and the children turn their hearts toward their parents. You know, God has just reached down and stopped everything. There's no entertainment, uh, there's no ball games, there's no sports. Many of the distractions that we enjoy, nobody's going on a cruise, no vacations are being lined up. But you know what is available to us? Time with our family. I said this the other day on the, on the video. Let me encourage you to just make that evening meal together sacrosanct. Make it something that from here on out, even from here through beyond this crisis, sit down with your family Talk together, eat together, fellowship together, and make it your worship time. Read God's Word. Let the children ask questions and learn. You be the teacher. Teach those children the Word of God. I look back on our family, and it happened so strongly in Peru as they were growing up when we didn't have any entertainments at that time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, we groan because we are eager for adoption. Verse number 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirits, we ourselves grown with our, within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Do you know what? I, we're, we're looking for a better place. Earth is great, but I'm looking for the redone earth, I'm the renewed earth, the retooled earth. I'm waiting for golden streets and gates of pearl myself. This is what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking for a better place. I love Iowa. It's my new home. I wasn't born here, but I own it. I love this place. I love people in Iowa. I love everything about it. I love the amount of colonies, and I love Winterset. I love to go to Clark Tower and climb that thing and look out across down there. I love it. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to make it my point. I'm going to do like these politicians. Now that I've, boy, I've just fallen in love with the place. I'm going to hit all 99, cal 99 counties one of these days, just see what's there. I love this place. I love the Andes of Peru. I spent many, many years living in Peru and walking through the Andes. I love the state of Maine in the United States, the ocean and the beauty and the green and, and the wildlife. Uh, but you know what? There's a better place. We groan because we're looking for the full adoption and, a, and to live in the better place. We're looking for a better life. It's coming. We don't have it now. We hear books being written about your best life now. Folks, it's just not true. Your best life is when Jesus brings you to be in his presence. I'm looking for, my, I'm, my spirit is groaning because I'm looking forward to the adoption when there will be an absence of sin. No more temptation. No more falling for the devil's lie, no more sin. I'm looking for, I'm looking for a full knowledge of the Holy One. I'm tired of looking through smoky glass. I want to see Jesus face to face. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking forward to seeing a full understanding of earth's experience. You know, there's a lot of people out there been asking why for, for hundreds of years. Why this? And why that happened? And why this? And what's going on? And, and the why is I believe one day we're going to have full understanding and he's, all going, to, he's going to make it all clear. And then I'm looking forward to full standing as God's sons and daughters enjoying a full inheritance without aging, without disease, and without sin. How wonderful, a full inheritance. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says Jesus is going to inherit everything. And the verse and verse that we just read back up in verse number 17 says, We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That means that what's coming to Him, we share with Him. Everything's coming to Jesus, and we get to share it. We're groaning, folks. We're groaning, but we wait because we have, verse 24 and 25, this hope. We have hope. A lot of hopelessness in the world today. Well, if you're a child of God and if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, this temporary veil of tears and problems and difficulties, it's just, it's not to be compared. I said it when we started. It's not to be compared, this groaning, this 
pain, this suffering. It's not to be compared to the weight of glory that waits for us. When we talk about this hope, it's not like a wish. It's not like I hope it doesn't rain or snow. It's not like a wish. It's not like I hope my investments turn out all right. I hope you didn't have too much hope in your investments. No, we have this hope. It is a fixed expectation of the realization of God's rock-solid promises. You know not one of his promises failed in the days of Moses. He said it over and over. Everything he promised those Jews he was going to do, he did. And I'm here to tell you not a single promise that he's made to us. And that promise of being with us always is true. That promise of not leaving the righteous forsaken or making the seed beg bread, it's true. God is taking care of you. You ought to just sing the song together in your homes. God will take care of you. He will take care of you. And he is taking care of you. Well, not one of God's promises has failed. I'm taking it to the bank. One day this present scourge of sin and its consequences will be over. And Jesus will come and make it right. I can't see it now except by the eyes of faith. But my soul groans and longs for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Finally, God's Holy Spirit groans for us. Look at verse number 26, if you would, please. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our, in our weakness, helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. So we've got the creation groaning. We've got the saints of God groaning for the adoption. And now then we have the Holy Spirit groaning. God's hearing a lot of groaning. There's a lot of groaning going on, and God hears it all. God, the, God is listening. The Holy Spirit groans for us before the Father. This whole chapter, chapter 8, is about life in the Spirit. We know a little bit of what the Holy Spirit does for us, but we don't have a, we don't have a clue to what all He's doing. We just got a little glimpse. You know what? When we're weak, He holds us up. Verse number 26, when we're weak. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. How many of you feel incapace right now? You just don't think like you can do it. You just don't have the capability to handle everything that's going on. Well, the Holy Spirit's going to hold you up in your weakness. Count on Him. Go to Him. Keep going to the Father. He'll keep giving you the Spirit. How can we go on with what's happening right now? Well, we're too weak to respond in the face of COVID-19, somebody says. Well, when under the strain of sickness or depression or worry or heartache, it is He, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us. Sometimes what is happening is just too big for us. And I'm sure that this is too big for us. Daniel knew all about that. There were moments in his life when the information he was getting and was supposed to convey to other people, write down for us, he was writing those things for us. It was too big for him. He said in Daniel 10, my Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. How can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength reigns, remains within me, nor is any breath in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of man touched me and he strengthened me. But I just want to tell you, for those of you that know Jesus, he has touched you and he'll just keep touching you. By His Spirit, He'll strengthen you. He'll give you strength for this journey. He'll give you strength for this coronavirus. He'll give you strength for these long days as we wait for news of a cure. And then it says something else. When we are weak in prayer, He prays for us. We don't know what to pray for sometimes. Do we pray, stop the virus, provide a cure? Or do we pray, do whatever work you are doing, Father. Get everything back to normal. Is that the prayer we should pray? Do we want to go back to a nation that largely ignores God? Maybe God is getting our attention. I pray that He keeps it. But it says here that when we're weak in prayer, He helps us in prayer. And also, when we are uncertain in prayer, He intercedes for us with non-human speech, groanings. Look at it, what it says there. It says, the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, words we can't even say. We don't even know what to say. We don't know what to pray for. Don't know how to say it. Don't know what's the right thing to pray for. But you know what? When we're groaning in our spirit to the Father, crying out in dependency on Him, the Holy Spirit takes our prayers, interprets them, and groans them out. He is our greatest partner in prayer. He prays for us. When we are misguided in prayer, He aligns it with the will of God. Look what it says. It says, Verse 27, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints of God according 
to the will of God. You know, sometimes what, so what we pray for is a little bit self-centered. Sometimes it's just simply selfish. Sometimes we pray amiss and we pray for things the book of James says to consume them on our lust. But the Bible says that if we are truly dependent on the Spirit in time of crisis, it says we can pray and even if misguided in prayer because of our dependency. And oh, I wish I could communicate to all of us today if God responds to our desperate dependency when we just like a child crawl up in his lap and say, Daddy, as we read last week, help me. God responds to desperate dependency, a faith that looks only to him. What a beautiful thing. Dear friends, at this this time of crisis, let me just say, the only wrong prayer is no prayer. All prayers by faith directed to the Father are the right prayer because the Holy Spirit is interceding for you and for me with words we could never pronounce. He is speaking the language of the Father. Well, folks, we come to verse number 28. It's our memory verse for today. I pray that you are continuing with your memory. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So I want to tell you this, God's plan is good for all. What God does is good because He is good. What God's plans is good for those who love Him. This isn't a blanket statement saying that everything that happens on planet earth is just plain good. Because everything that happens is not good for those that are not in tune with Him. Who don't know Him. Who don't love Him. We know that all things work together. And we have to say hard things and painful things and pleasurable things. Health and sickness. Times of plenty and times of penury. All things work together for good. Everything does. I'm reminded of a story from one of my best friends, Brother Steve Pinkley, and many of you know him. He is uh, the administrator and the leader up at the camp, um, Hidden Acres up there near Dayton. And uh, he's been leading up there for a while. And I remember a time ago whenever Alyssa, his daughter, Alyssa Pinkley, um, she was about 12 years old, 13 years old, and was the training partner in gymnastics with Sean Johnson. Everybody knows that name. She won many gold medals and did us proud in the two different Olympics. Well, she was the training partner with Sean Johnson, and from what I understand, was very good, maybe not as good, but very, very good, headed for the Olympics. The unthinkable happened to little Alyssa. She had a, a fracture of the ball of the top of her leg going into her hip. She began to feel pain. She got to the place where she could not continue to do all of her exercises and all of her gymnastic uh, trials and things. And so when they finally got to a a doctor, a specialist, to find out what was wrong, found out that she had this degenerative thing going on in her hip and that her gymnastics career was over. I remember sitting with Steve with the tears running down his face as he was trying to ask me how to pick up his sweet little daughter and encourage her at this time when her air castles had just crumbled and her dreams had just fallen apart. It was just a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Well, time went on. They went out to John Hopkins Hospital to a specialist. They stayed with the family for a period of time out there, and, and uh, they began to rebuild a friendship with an old friend. And, and uh, the news was not good. She was just not going to be able to go, go and do what she wanted to do as she was growing up. And so had to have a hip operation. Well, time went by. And a few months or a few years ago, right after or before one of the recent Olympics, the story broke about a man by the name of Larry Nasser, who was the head of the, uh, he was one of the, uh, one of the people that was examining. He was, the, he was uh, involved with the Olympics. He was the head of their health traveled with the teams, and it came out that he had molested many, 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 many of those girls. Larry Nasser was the destiny of Steve Pinkley's daughter. He would have been in charge of her. Steve is given God glory and thanks as well as his daughter a thousand times over for stopping them in their plans and putting his plan in order. But do you know... Even in the process of all of this pain, in the time that they were in Baltimore, out there near John Hopkins, staying with the family, there was a little girl at that house, a six-year-old girl. 
that fell in love with Alyssa, and Alyssa became her hero. And she paid attention to everything that Alyssa had to say. Well, as time went on, Alyssa invited her to come out to the camp to Hidden Acres. And when she was 12 years old, she came to the camp. And while she was there on a Thursday night, she gave her heart to Jesus. She went home, and her family wasn't a church-going family, but she just begged her family to go to church and to start listening. And do you know that everybody in that family has come to Jesus now, and all of them go to church? You see, all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And so what God purposed is glorious for all He called. God is doing something, and the events of our lives are working together to fulfill His plan. And what God predestined is certain to be completed. Look at verse number 29. It says, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now get this verse. Moreover, whom he predestined, that is, he worked out in ages, in ages past, those he predestined, these he called. He made sure that we heard the gospel call. And those he called, these he also justified. He provided the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could be made just as if we never sinned. He justified, and these he also glorified. Ephesians says that we are seated with Jesus in the heavenly places even now. In the mind of God, he has glorified us for eternity, and he's given us a portion of the Spirit in our lives today to give us glory. Now, I just want to end this today by saying hallelujah. Don't get frustrated. Be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Be comforted in the knowledge of whose you are to whom you belong, who your heavenly Father is. Don't get frustrated because our present suffering does not compare. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation. And then he says, do not lose heart in verse chapter 4, 16. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. I could go on and on. My time's more than up. But I want to encourage you today, dear brethren. All things work together for good for those who love God. I can close by just asking the question, do you know him? Are you the child of God? Have you put your faith and trust in him? Has he called you? Is he ready to justify you? Is he ready are you ready to call on him? For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, we stand ready. The phones will be ready all week long. You can call if you'd like to come and talk to somebody about your soul and about receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that you too can say, all things work together for me because I love God too. He has saved me. We'll love to talk to you about it. Let's close. In a word of prayer, our Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. I had so much to say, and I was trying to get everything said. But, Lord, there's so much more to say about your amazing love. So much more to say about this indwelling spirit. So much more to say about the fact that we have this hope, a hope that endures. Bless us as we face the task in front of us and the difficult days. Help us to just look to Jesus because he is the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.